Thank you, praise team. I hope uh, you were all listening to the words you were singing this morning. What wonderful words. What a great sermon we've already had just through those, through those words. Well, stand with me, will you please, for our scripture reading from Luke 9. Uh, you know, one of the things I'd encourage you to do week by week is um, you can pretty much tell where we're at in the book of Luke. Uh, read ahead to the next section and see if you can figure out what in the world the message is going to be. Uh, you'll find you get that much more out of it as, as you do that and as we worship together. But today, Luke 9, beginning in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your patience. Thank you for your mercy, for your love. Lord, we've, we've sung today so much about your holiness, your greatness, the awesomeness that attaches to you, and I pray that we would see that again this morning, that um, you would open your word to us, open your life to us. We um, acknowledge, Lord, we would know nothing of you if you hadn't taken the time to reveal yourself in your word and in your son, and so we are deeply grateful. Help us now as we study together. Guide us and be our teacher, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Somebody, I think it was uh, James Dobson, not 100% sure, but they wrote about this sign that they saw outside of a convent somewhere in South Carolina. The sign said, absolutely no trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And it was signed, Sisters of Mercy. Uh, <laughs> Somehow it seemed a little bit incompatible. We, but we all need mercy, don't we? We all want justice. We talk about justice all the time. Let's be fair. And we think we're seeking justice. But when we really examine the law of God, and when we realize how Jesus taught that it's not so much what we do, but it's what's going on in our heart that we will be accountable for one day, we need mercy. It's not justice that we really need the most. We need mercy. And so thankfully, we have a God who is rich in mercy, right? Paul reminds us of that when he says, but God who is rich in mercy, when we were still dead in our trespasses and sins, has made us alive together in Christ. What a merciful Savior we have, and how this is reflected in this passage of Scripture. Other gods are demanding, but the God of the Bible is a God of mercy, and he's a God who gives. And our text today is going to deal with this. Now, Luke 9.51 is a great, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dividing point in the book of Luke. It's, it's the hinge upon which the first section and the second section come together. And so you can expect that we're going to see some changes prior to this verse when it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Luke is, Luke is cueing us things are going to change. Prior to this, Jesus is coming. It's all about his coming. Now it's going to be about his going. Prior to this, Luke has been emphasizing acceptance of Christ. After this, it's going to be an emphasis on the gradual rejection of Christ. Prior to this, it's been about the acclaim that he received. Now it's going to be about the humiliation that he will go through. Prior to this, it's been about the person of Christ. Who is he? And now it's going to be about the work of Christ. He's leaving Galilee. He's beginning about a six-month journey to the city of Jerusalem, during which we will see many other things. Luke... One of the reasons I really love this gospel devotes about 40% of his gospel to that coming period of time. 
That's by contrast to Matthew, who devotes two chapters to it, 19 and 20, and Mark, who devotes one chapter to this period of time, Mark 10. So we're not going to see nearly as much overlap with the other Gospels as we move forward now in the book of Luke. So there's a lot that's going to be unique in Luke at this point. Now this passage, the emphasis is upon the mercy of God. And the mercy of God expressed particularly through Jesus Christ. So we might ask, well, what is mercy? I like the definition that you will sometimes hear that's used to distinguish between mercy and grace. And many of you will be familiar with this, but the distinction goes like this. It says, mercy is God not giving us what we deserve so those who are believers have the mercy of God in their life and that they're not getting the judgment that we are rightfully deserving of. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, the eternal life that can come through him. That's a pretty good distinction between those two things. And today we're gonna to look at particularly the mercy of God. Now I'm gonna use a threefold outline to look at this passage, the resolution that Jesus has, the rejection that he suffers, and then the rebuke that he gives, and we'll learn a lot about his mercy as we go through that. The resolution begins in verse 51. Look at the end of that verse where he says, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus, from this point on, is very set toward Jerusalem. He has his face pointed that direction. He knows what awaits him there, but it's been prophesied, and so it has to occur. Jesse read the prophecy this morning. By the way, he and I don't coordinate other than he knows what the sermon title is, but somehow he picked the right passage. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I'm going to emphasize one verse in that passage where it says, I gave my back. This is Isaiah speaking as though he is the Messiah, the suffering Messiah. And he did this, by the way, keep in mind, 700 years before the coming of Christ. It says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Jesus knows exactly what's awaiting him in Jerusalem, but it's not gonna be shame that he's gonna suffer ultimately. There will be humiliation, there will be death, but it will also be the time of ultimate triumph. And so knowing the difficulty that's going to be there before the triumph that comes, he still sets his face toward Jerusalem to get there. Picture him like, in some ways, he's been, he's been here on earth now 32 years and six months, roughly. And here he is now heading for home. The end is in sight. You can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. He's in the home stretch. And that's kind of what we see in his demeanor and his outlook from this point forward as he looks forward to the completion of this great mission that God the Father has sent him on. Now I want to look, as we, as we look at the division of this verse, first of all, let's, let's review the coming of Christ, and then we'll look at the going, the coming of Christ. Up until now, Luke has been focused on that part of the mission of Christ. Luke, more than anyone, described the unusual birth of Christ, the virgin birth, the things that happened with Mary, and the predictions of the birth of both Jesus and John the Baptist. The overriding question in this first section of the book of Luke has been, who is this Jesus? Who exactly is this historical person? And Luke has answered that question in many ways through the passage of scripture that led up to this through the preaching of Jesus. He's given us insight into that. Through the ways that Jesus' life fulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament, he's given us insight into that through his great miracles. We've seen him forgive sin and we've seen him accept worship. Luke has presented us here a person who is like no other person who ever lived. And in doing so, he has affirmed the reality that this person is the Messiah. This person is God in the flesh. His case is made. It's an astounding revelation. 
Astounding revelation grounded in facts and locked down by the fact that this person really lived and he really did and accomplished all these things that have been accomplished. Who is Jesus? He's God in the flesh. That's who he is. You know, the answer to that question in these chapters in Luke was somewhat brought to a head when Peter answered Jesus' question, who do you say that I am by saying you're the Christ of God? You're the son of the living God. And then it was kind of the apex of the whole thing was the transfiguration where you remember for that one brief shining moment, the deity of Christ shone through on that wonderful night when the disciples were there with him. And God the Father affirmed him by saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is a resounding affirmation that Jesus is truly Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the word who became flesh. Jesus is Jacob's ladder that now bridges the gap between heaven and earth. Jesus is the seed that was prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that would be the redeemer who would come to redeem men that God prophesied after the first sin. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Genesis 49, Jesus is the son of David from 2 Samuel 8. Uh, 2 Samuel 8. He's, the, he's the son of man from Daniel 9, the one who will have dominion forever. Jesus is the one who fulfills all of these Old Testament prophecies and many more. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God delivering his people, all who will believe in him. That's who Jesus is. And if you don't know that, Jesus... You don't know Jesus. Jesus can't be written off as a myth or a fairy tale like the gods of the Greek religions. Tim Keller challenges this with this statement. Listen to this carefully because it's very insightful. He says, no one has ever discovered a word that Jesus ought to have said. Read the accounts. You try to come up with better lines. Do you realize what kind of person it would take to make this up? He's saying if Jesus isn't real, then somebody out there is just as good as he is who could make this all up. He goes on. If somebody made this up, we would be sitting here having the same kind of discussion asking who is this incredible person who made this up? He is always surprising you. He is always taking your breath away because he's better than you can imagine. Why? They are the surprises of perfection. He, can tr he combined attributes never seen before. Tenderness without weakness. Strength without harshness. Holiness and unbending conviction without the slightest lack of approachability. Power without insensitivity. Never a jarring note. The apostles knew that they were looking through the substance of human flesh to the being of God. What power could have ever gotten them to believe it? And if you understand the, what first century Jews believed about the monotheism, that there's one God and one God only, and now to see some of these men accepting Jesus as God, you realize what Keller is saying. This is an amazing thing. They saw it firsthand. They were eyewitnesses of it. That's why they came to faith in Christ. And so Luke closes this section, who is Jesus, by answering it without equivocation. He is God. So how about the going? What's going to come up? What's coming in the next few chapters? The going. He's a third. He's headed for home. The new question is, why did he come? Who is he? It's been answered. Why did he come? According to verse 51, Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. But note that Jerusalem is only an interim stop. It's an interim stop. Luke 13, verse 33, we're gonna see that it says for a prophet, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a very critical stop. It's not the ultimate, but it's a critical one. But it's not ultimate. He's ultimately going on. Look at the rest of verse 51. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up. To be taken up. What does it mean when the days drew near for him to be taken up? 
Many answer that question by saying, well, that's obvious. It's just speaking of the crucifixion of Christ when he was lifted up. And they will quote John 3, verses 14 and 15, where John reminds us, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Well, that's a true statement, is it not? And it's part of the process. It's part of the being taken up. But beloved, Luke's reference here is to Jesus' ultimate return to heaven. It's to Jesus' ultimate return to heaven when his mission will be complete. Jesus is looking not just to that interim point in the mission, the death of Christ, he's looking to the moment when it will be done. When we back to the Father from where he came, that's where he's looking. Why did he come? Mark 10, 45. Many passages answer that question, but Mark 10, 45 gives a wonderful answer. It says, the Son of Man came not to serve, not to be served, but what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jerusalem was the interim stop. It had to be, had to go to Jerusalem to become the ultimate Passover lamb. But see, after the death of Christ, there's the resurrection and there's the ascension, which amounts to the Father putting his stamp of approval on all of this and basically saying, by what he does in the resurrection and the ascension, mission accomplished. You've done what I sent you to do. You've made salvation available to anyone who would accept it. Now we know that that's what's in view here because Luke uses a particular word when he says he was taken up. He uses a Greek word, analambano. It's a word that we find elsewhere. Turn with me to Acts chapter one, Acts one. So I wanna kind of nail down for you that this being taken up is the whole process of death, resurrection, and ascension. In, in Acts chapter one, verse nine, Luke writes this. And uh, this is after the resurrection. Jesus is with his disciples for the last time. And it says, and when he had said certain things to them, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. This is Jesus returning to heaven. This is the ascension after he has completed the mission that God has sent him to do. And three times, three times in Acts chapter one, Luke, who's the same author as the book of Luke, wrote Acts, uses the word analambano to speak of this taking up. Three times. It's there in verse two, it's in verse 11, and it's in verse 22. Now look specifically with me for a moment at verse 11. It says that there were angels standing by as Jesus ascends and they say, men of Galilee, speaking to the apostles, why are you standing here looking into heaven? Well, wouldn't you be, I mean, put yourself in their place. You'd be doing the same thing, right? But the angel's saying, well, why are you doing that? Because he wants to make a point. He says, this same Jesus who was taken up on a lumbano, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. And so I take it that in Luke 9, 51, Luke is describing the completion of Jesus' mission of redemption. When he says he was looking forward to the time when he would be taken up. It's the time when he would leave planet Earth, where he's been for 33 years to accomplish this great purpose that God sent him to accomplish. But the road to the ascension leads through Jerusalem because it's in Jerusalem that he must pay the penalty for our sins on the cross. Think of it this way, beloved, and listen carefully now because this is the heart of this passage. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross before he could go to heaven. He had to go to heaven by way of the cross. Beloved, you and I have to go to heaven by way of the cross. Jesus came to pay for the sins of the world at the cross. 
And those of us who are gonna be saved have to come to the cross to receive the forgiveness that he offers there. Jesus had to go to the cross to become sin for us. We have to go to the cross to become the righteousness of God in him. The cross is the center of everything. There is no other way to heaven. The point of this verse and this critical hinge verse in the, in, in, the, in the book of Luke is that everything hinges on the cross. That's why Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. Had Jesus bypassed the cross? Had Jesus not gone to Jerusalem? Had he said, I don't think I can go through that. I'm gonna bypass the cross. There would be no salvation. There would be no hope. There would be no redemption for mankind. And beloved, if you and I bypass the cross personally, there is no salvation, there is no hope, there is no redemption because there's no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. It all hinges on the cross. So that's what this verse is all about. Think of it this way. At the cross, the lamb must become my lamb. And if you're gonna be saved and spend eternity with God, the same must be true with you. Jesus has done his part. He went to the cross. The question for us is, have we been to the cross? Have we been there and repented of our sins and asked him to be our Lord and Savior in all honesty. It all hinges on the cross. Now the next session of this passage focuses on the fact that not everybody is gonna accept that offer of salvation. Some reject. And so we see the rejection that comes in this passage in verse 52. It says he sent in, in Luke, back in Luke 9. If I can get there, there we go. He sent messengers on ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. I mean, it's not a strange reason not to accept someone because his face is set toward Jerusalem. So what? What, what is that all about? Well, what that's about, beloved, is a 900-year-old feud some of you are aware of, some of you may not be. 900 years before this, something started that still has implications on this particular day. Israel had three kings in their history who ruled over the whole of the country of Palestine. Saul, followed by David, followed by Solomon, right? All three of them, beginning in 11, 1070 BC and ended in 930 B.C. when Solomon died. And when Solomon died, he left his son Rehoboam on the throne. Rehoboam overtaxed the people. And before long, there was a great revolt. And a man named Jeroboam led a revolt against him, started a civil war. And before long, the, the, the nation of Israel had been divided into two parts. One was ruled by Rehoboam in the south, comprised of only two tribes were left, Benjamin and Judah. It's where Jerusalem was. The kings that followed in that line were all of the line of David. And so Judah becomes a very important piece of the Old Testament. But in the northern part of the kingdom, what in Jesus' time would have been Galilee and Samaria, 10 tribes formed their own nation. Jeroboam was their first king. Those 10 tribes formed a nation that was called sometimes in the Old Testament Israel and sometimes Samaria. You'll See it under both titles in the Old Testament, but if you don't understand that distinction, the Old Testament won't make any sense to you. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Now the kings that followed in the north, what was called Israel, for the next 200 years, there were 19 of them. Not a single one of them was a good king. They were all idolatrous. Jeroboam started it. His people in the north wanted to go down to Jerusalem to worship. 
That's where the place of worship was supposed to be that had been established. Jeroboam didn't want them going down there. He was afraid he would lose their loyalty if they didn't. So he led them into idolatry. He established other worship places at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and had his own religion going. But because the idolatry continued for 200 years without respite, despite the prophets that God sent, God finally sent the Israel into captivity to the Assyrians in 722. B.C. The Syrians came in, took over. They sent people in. They intermarried with the Jews who were there. And so they, before long, became the half-breeds that we know as the Samaritans of Jesus' time that the true Jews down in Judah hated. And the Samaritans returned the favor. They hated the Jews. It was all because of that 900-year-old feud and what you see when it says they rejected Jesus because his face was set toward Jerusalem, you now understand it's because he's going down to Jerusalem to worship and the Samaritans so hated the Jewish religion and they so hated the Jews in general that if somebody was going to Jerusalem to worship and they knew that, they wouldn't even do business with them. It meant more to, more to them than money to express their hatred. So when they knew Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover, they rejected him. Now, beloved, just think about that for just a moment. Samaritans haven't had a lot of opportunity to hear about Jesus because the Jews and Samaritans avoided each other. Usually when you went from Galilee in the north to Judah in the south, you bypassed Samaria. And the Samaritans, you went by way of Perea on the other side of the Jordan River. That's just the way they did it. They didn't have much to do with each other. We know that there was some interaction. Jesus stopped at the well of Jacob, you may remember in John 4, and visited the woman at the well who was a Samaritan, and she came to know Christ and brought a bunch of other people in the city to Christ at that point in time. But there hadn't been a lot of interaction. So they didn't know Jesus well, and their religion led them to reject the very one who was going to Jerusalem to do what? To pay the penalty for their sin to make possible for them, just as he did for everyone else, the possibility of being right with God. But they rejected him flat, standing face to face with the one who would be the redeemer. They turned him down. Not a pretty picture, is it? They remind us of a world, beloved, that rejects Christ without sometimes really knowing very much about him without knowing who he really is, without taking time to really examine who is this Jesus who claims to be God? Who is this Jesus who claims to have died for the sins of the world? Somebody makes that claim. Don't you think it would be advisable to check it out? The story is told of a preacher years ago, a teacher, Bible teacher. He showed up in Boston to hold a series of meetings. A professor, an instructor from Harvard, was invited to the meetings. He met with the pastor ahead of time. A friend invited him and, and, and introduced him to the pastor. And he said, well, you know, I'm here and I'm going to listen, but you should know, I just want you to know going in, I'm not interested in the gospel. I don't believe in Christ. I don't believe I need forgiveness of sins. And the pastor said, well, I understand. He said, in fact, I... I even know why you're not interested. The guy says, you what? You know why I'm not interested? The pastor said, yeah, you're right here in the Bible. He says, what? He said, yeah, you're right here. You're in John 3.19. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. You're right there. And the guy says, what? I'm not, I'm not evil. I don't do bad things. He took great offense. The pastor said, no, no, I don't, you, you don't understand. I'm not saying that you're evil in the sense that you've committed murder or that you've robbed somebody or that you've been doing, you know, raping people. I'm not saying you're evil in that sense. Evil is anything that keeps you from Christ. Evil can be the stacks in the Harvard Library where you go to investigate some new problem in Shakespeare and try and answer that. If those books and your study are the thing that keep you from Christ, it's destroying you. And the world of books can be just as destructive as the world of lust and robbery and murder. 
The world of religion can be just as destructive as the world of sex trafficking if it keeps us from Jesus. We miss the point, beloved, so often in the Bible, rejecting Jesus is the ultimate evil. We can think of a lot of other evils, right? Live in a world full of evils. There's nothing more evil than rejecting the God who died for you. That's the ultimate evil. That was the Samaritans. Could it be us? Rejecting Christ, doing all the right things, but rejecting Savior. So thirdly, in this passage, what about the rebuke? James and John are incensed by this rejection of Jesus. So it says in verse 54, when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? You have to love these guys, don't you? I mean, wouldn't the appropriate thing to been to say, Jesus, why don't you call fire down from heaven? No, they want to do it. <laughs> they want to have the privilege. They want to be the guys that get the privilege of wiping these people out. They're gutsy. You got to give them that. Of course, they're dead wrong. They're not in line with the character or the mercy or the heart of God <laughs> at all in this case. I, I suspect, remember, we're, we're not very far away from the transfiguration, right? When they've been on that mountain and they've seen Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, and they're well aware that in 2 Kings 1, and not just on one occasion, but on two occasions, Elijah called down fire from heaven to wipe out some soldiers who had been sent to capture him because he'd spoken out against the idolatry of the king of Israel. And I guess by that time, you know, it had kind of taken shape in their mind. Well, hey, if Elijah could do it, we must be the extension of Elijah. After all, we were there on the mountain. If he could call down from fire from heaven, surely we can. So let's have our own fire here. If it's good enough for Elijah, why wouldn't it be good enough for them? But you see, they had neither the spirit of Elijah nor the spirit of God. They didn't really understand. Here's, and here's where they were so dead wrong, beloved. Listen, what they, were, what they were really doing, think about this, calling fire down from it. They were wanting to send these people to hell and they were taking joy in the prospect. They were thinking, this is a good thing. These guys have so rejected Jesus. This is, this is a good thing. They're joying in sending men to hell. God will send people to hell one day, beloved, but he takes no joy in it. Even in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18, verse 23, God said, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? I'd much rather they repented. That's what I want to have happen. The first coming of Jesus, what was it? The second coming of Jesus, we know it's going to be about judgment. Everything we read in the Bible tells us that's the time when the judgment will finally fall in a very dramatic way. But the first coming of the Lord and his incarnation wasn't about judgment. What was it about? It was about providing the possibility of forgiveness, right? God, Jesus says this, John three seventeen. for the Son of Man came not the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. That's why he came. It says in Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus didn't come to kill the Samaritans and call fire down from heaven on them. He came to provide the possibility for their forgiveness. That's where his heart was. James and John were about as out of line as they could be. So Jesus rebuked them. We don't know exactly what he said, but I wouldn't have wanted to be there, would you? He rebuked them, and they moved on. You know, this, what is the gospel? The gospel has a two-sided message, does it not? The gospel 
presents a God who is two-sided. There's the love of God and there's the wrath of God against sin. It's two sides of the same coin. Problem in our world is we wanna have the one side and we don't want the other. And if we're gonna present the gospel effectively and if we're gonna be true to scripture, if we're gonna be true representatives of God, we have to present both sides, right? Yes, there is judgment coming, but we must never take joy in that pronouncement. I listened to preachers as I was growing up who would preach about hell and I'm, I'm telling you, I think it, you almost felt like they wanted to go there themselves. So joyous at the prospect that somebody might get theirs. It's not the heart of God, beloved. Second Peter 3, 9, what does Peter say? He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. Our God is a God of mercy. He's a God of patience, waiting as long as he possibly can. He gives every possible chance for repentance before judgment finally falls. Listen, we can't represent him correctly if we don't talk about the judgment. That would be wrong. But neither can we represent him correctly, beloved, if we don't do it from a heart of compassion. Compassion. We don't care as he cares. Now, I love the end of this story. It's not, it's not found in Luke. It's found in Acts. You have to turn to Acts chapter 8. This is kind of like the Paul Harvey thing, right? The rest of the story. Acts chapter 8. We're a, we're a short time later. Jesus has by this time gone to Jerusalem. He has died. He has been resurrected. He has ascended back to the Father. The disciples have regrouped. They've begun to preach the gospel on the streets of Jerusalem and thousands of people upon thousands of people have been saved in the city of Jerusalem and committed their life to the Christ that they crucified a few weeks before. But in time, persecution came because the leaders in Jerusalem didn't believe in Christ. They began to kill people who were expressing their faith in Christ. And so this great dispersion began to happen and they began to go as they were supposed to go in the first place to other places. And one of the places they went was just north to Samaria of all places. And guess what happened in Samaria? Revival broke out. As they began to preach Christ and him crucified, Philip, one of the great deacons in the early church, was preaching in Samaria and his great revival broke out and eventually Peter and John went up there to support. And look at this in John, uh, Acts chapter eight and verse 25. Now when they, and the they there is Peter and John, James by this time has, has been killed as a martyr, when they, Peter and John, had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, watch this now, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. I can't read that without wondering, did John go back and preach the gospel at the place where he was going to call down fire from heaven? I can't imagine that he didn't, can you? I can't imagine Jesus didn't send him there. And I can't imagine that he didn't go wonderfully enthusiastic to share the gospel because he now had the mind of heart, the, the, the heart of Christ implanted with him. Compassion was now the center of his being. And mercy was what he realized this message was about. Yes, judgment will come, but first, let's give people every opportunity we possibly can to come to Christ and leave the, mercy, leave the, leave the judgment to God. Some of you, I know, have read, and some of you have been reading not too long ago, the book Radical by David Platt. You may remember a couple in there called Ed and Patty. They are in there. At the time he wrote the book, they were in their early 70s. They were retired. <clears throat> but given all the options they might have followed, they did something quite different than most people do when they retired. 
They began to do mission work wherever they could find opportunity. It's recorded in the book that in the one particular year between, October, between July 1 and end of October, they were only home for 11 days. The rest of the time they were out providing relief where they could to flood victims in the United States. They had been to Nigeria on a mission trip over there. And then Ed had gone to Sri Lanka where he was helping some missionaries minister among, them, uh, among some rebel activity that was going on over there. He said, he said he, he was quoted in the book, he said, Patty doesn't like to sleep under trucks while rebel activity is going on, so she didn't go to Sri Lanka, <laughs> but she went to the other places that he had gone. Somebody asked him, why are you doing this? He said this, he said, what else am I gonna do with my retirement? I just wanna tell as many people about the gospel as I can. That's a heart that beats with the mercy that, that the heart of God beats with, don't you think? It is. And beloved, I think the question for us is, what does our heart look like? I hear, you know what I fear? I fear that many of us would rather call down fire from heaven on certain politicians that we don't agree with. We'd rather call down fire from heaven on certain people who don't have the same moral structure in life that we do. We'd rather call fire down from heaven on people, I, I, I don't know who it is, the guy down the street whose dog runs loose in the neighborhood. Yeah, I, whatever it is. We'd rather call fire down from heaven than we would to share Christ. Let's share Christ. Let's have the compassion and the mercy that he did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. It's a challenge to us to see your great heart, to be invited in to be a part of what you're doing in this world. So I pray that you will help us to do that. Give us compassion. It's easy to have compassion, Lord, on those we love. It's very hard to have compassion on those we don't care for so much, that irritate us, that have values that are different from us, that act differently than we do, that are so obviously causing destructive behavior in one place or another. Sometimes we do have to take a stand, of course. We have a wonderful military upon whom we play your blessing as they protect us from some of these forces. Lord, our job in general is to share you, and I pray that you'll give us a heart of compassion to do that. It matches the mercy that you show. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.